Welcome to this uh, panel discussion we have arranged today, where we would like to focus and dive into, um, you know, how do you choose the right dam solution for your organization, uh, and also, you know, how do you succeed with that? And I'm extremely proud and humbled to have, um, you know, dam veterans with me on this uh, uh, panel discussion today. Uh, so first of all, my name is Kim Walters. I'm the CEO of DigiSuite, and uh, we have. With me, I'm proud to have Brett Lipscomb from MCR Safety, who is a manager of Digital Solution. Um, MCR is a MCR Safety has more than 40 years of experience as a leader in the field of personal protective equipment across hundreds of industries and professions. So, warmly welcome to you, Brett. Yeah, appreciate it, Kim. Thanks for being. Uh, thanks for having us. Excellent. Thank you for joining. And with me is also Joe Selling from uh, Volvo and Mack Truck and. Uh, um, Joe is the Digital Marketing Process and Solution Manager, and I think all of us knows Mack Trucks and Volvo Trucks, which is a global truck manufacturer uh, and actually the world's largest manufacturer of heavy-duty trucks. So, warmly welcome to you, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Kim, for the invite. Really glad to be here to talk about digital asset management and uh, how it can help other people learn more about these products. Exactly. That's the whole purpose is, uh, you know, sharing some of your experiences and uh, happy to facilitate that. And, and last but not least, uh, I warmly welcome to you, Jason Perry from uh, Engagency, uh, the CEO of uh, the company. And Engagency has over a decade of experience in specializing uh, in enterprise digital transformation projects uh, with certified experts within a wide range of leading MarTech platforms. So you can give a little bit, uh, you know, broader perspective maybe on some topics. So very warmly welcome to you, Jetson. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Good. So, um, yeah, as we dive in in, uh, in different topics uh, over uh, the course of this panel discussion, let's start out with, you know, the questions of, you know, what business problems did you have that led to you to understand that you actually needed a dam. And uh, I think, Joe, if you can, uh, can start out on, on that one. Sure, sure. I'd be glad to kick it off. Uh, so I think we had, you know, it's a pretty clear business case in a couple of different arenas, and I'll break them down in three different uh, ways. One is, is that we had uh, risk that we wanted to address. We also had feedback from our field staff and our dealers. And then we also had some issues and problems with accuracy. And so if you, I think many people would recognize a risk factor and start thinking about, you know, where do you have assets stored? And so one of our business case uh, issues was that we were trying to find where does everything sit? Where we have people that are developing content all the time, right? And whether it be a, you know, a photographer, a videographer, it could be a third party agency that's working with us. There's all types of different scenarios where content gets created. And it's really, you know, in a company, it's really hard to always put your hands around everything. And so that was one of the biggest things that we were trying to do. Let's make sure that we have a centralized place where things get stored and then also repurpose uh, for various different needs. Um, likewise, in, in step with that, if you think about our users in the field, not necessarily being in the corporation in the office with us, right? Them being able to find content really easily was a real problem. So we might push out a piece of content that um, could be consumed by them, but them having a clear path and understanding where to get that information um, was always an issue. And then the last one to go back and talk about accuracy. Sometimes we do multiple photo shoots um, with certain trucks and we may have to change, let's say a mirror as a good example, that product changes and we need to be able to represent the proper product and so in order to do that, obviously, we need to have some type of version control and an asset management and a process that in lies with managing those assets. So that's where we started to get to the point where we can't do these types of things manually. These are the type of things that we need a system to really help us uh, manage these types of assets and have a clear path of where they are located. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. And I can imagine you know, with the product and line of business you're in, you know, staging a photo shoot and, and creating that with uh, with the types of product is, is is not, you know, a cheap or easy task to to set up. So there's probably a lot of efforts and resources that, that goes into the 
the production cycle of of, uh, of these assets. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So if we said, you know, today if I went out and ordered a truck, you know, those trucks are anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars plus. And then if you added a dump body on the back of it or a cement mixer or whatever the different configurations are, that price starts going up quite quickly. And that's just to be able to take the photo, right? And then we have the photographer and then we have, you know, the equipment maybe or the internal team that may be doing it. So there's there's a lot of cost that these assets actually represent, which you can't necessarily put your hand around it really easily. But if you start sitting back and looking at it and talking with executive teams and management, you can quickly identify the cost of these assets. They're not cheap. And uh, so, you know, that's where it gets back to making sure that you have really reducing your risk of where content gets deployed and making sure it just doesn't disappear because somebody walked off with a hard drive that's no longer working for us anymore. So that's always a risk that, you know, you just want to cover yourself from that standpoint. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point. Thanks, Joe. And, and maybe serve it all to you, Brett. Uh, so even though you're in the di very different line of business, I'm, I'm curious to learn a little bit, you know, what, what was you, the problems that led you to make uh, that decision, um, investing in dam technology? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, a dam technology for us actually um, ended up being a side effect of something that we were trying to solve kind of company-wide. Um, initially, we started looking at like a document solution for kind of around our credit department. Um, that's kind of really where the whole ball got rolling, where everything got started from. So we were really siloed into, uh, like I said, finding a document solution for document repository, for searching, indexing, that type of thing uh, for our credit department that gets you know, thousands of invoices and trying to search through bank documents, things like that. So security was clearly a main issue. But as we started searching uh, for just various document solutions, I felt like at that moment we were kind of um, had a little bit of blinders on, if you will. We were, you know, so focused in on just that solution, and we actually stumbled upon the the idea of digital asset management or a dam solution, and it, it kind of turned a light bulb on for us in the fact that wow, look, check this out. So maybe this will not only solve our document issue, but you know, can we leverage this in other departments and, and kind of solve some other issues uh, that we're having? So, you know, just like Joe had mentioned, um, you know, we're kind of no different in the fact that we have, you know, literally thousands of product SKUs uh, that we sell uh, manufacturing personal protective equipment. And we have, you know, images of the front of the glove and the back of the glove and the 360 degree images of the glove, eyewear, high visibility vests. So, I mean, we have digital assets for these um, you know, product images. And as we stumbled upon the damn solutions, we realized, okay, we actually have a bigger problem. Uh, similar to like Joe mentioned, we have assets everywhere. Uh, people were sharing, you know, product images via their email, um, stored on local hard drives, stored on local file shares and Dropbox. I mean, no one knew really where the latest product image was because we'll change the design on a glove sometimes a couple times a year because um, we actually, you know, we manufacture, we don't outsource the manufacturing, we you know, manufacture them ourselves and the complete design process is also in-house and so you know we'll find a, a niche market uh, like the oil industry for example we'll do some trial runs for a pair of gloves uh, you know find improvements that we need to make and change the design you know mid-year and so of course we have to reshoot those photos and then now we want to make sure that our sales folks of course have the the latest product images and, and most up-to-date information so we took a step back when we kind of discovered you know the whole digital asset management life cycle and really holistically looked at how we can apply that, you know, kind of across every department, whether it's sales, marketing, uh, even finance, you know, it's kind of using our production department that's creating uh, custom logos on a garment chest, for example. So, I mean, that's kind of how we, we got into it. And we realized that the, the solution that digital asset management was going to bring to us was, was way more vast than we initially started looking at um, our initial solution for an interesting story how you start looking at something different or solving a different problem that kind of evolved into you know understanding this from a broader perspective within within the company and and also even though your you know your products is is a little bit easier to state i imagine that that a, a truck like volvo uh, has but but still you know the variance the changes the things that go on uh, means that you know there is a lot of actions and, and a lot of photo shoots a lot of changes going on 
and and it has a lot of volume with with all the SKUs and 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 part numbers there. So maybe over to you, uh, Jason, in terms of stepping back and looking, uh, maybe you know, as as a across more co companies or organization industries where you know you work with a lot of different types of clients. So so how do you see this you know challenge and and where do you you know see customers starting their journey on 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 them? Oh, we have a oh. yes. Uh, so I think a lot of the uh, conversations start where you know Joe and Brett um, uh, are or were um, really kind of tactical needs, um, and um, and I think that's always kind of the beginning of the conversation. They have some very practical needs that need to be solved. Um, but when you start to talk about the kind of the broader digital transformation, um, you start to realize that there are a lot more inherent values to a dam solution and PIM and <clears throat> these kind of these structured data systems. So when you look at things like A-B testing and personalization and advanced search capabilities, um, to be able to pull those off, you have to have your data structured and tagged in a way that uh, that the, the various personalization and, and A-B testing systems can actually make sense of them. Um, same with search. So, you know, DAM and, and, and systems like PIM are, are kind of a foundational layer uh, to any kind of major uh, digital transformation. So uh, you really can't do these things properly until you have all your data structured. Um, so this is... Um, this is really uh, kind of the next layer, the more strategic reasons to be getting into uh, in, into dam. Um, and I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so, so I think the stories that that Joe and, and Brett shared is 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 also similar to a lot of the customers that I meet. You know, there can be you know operational issues, you know efficiency issues that that companies or organizations are trying to solve. It can also be compliance or risk reduction, uh, getting you know more control of, of content, uh, or it can be an experience perspective where you want to you know delight customers or, or do different uh, experience, maybe even with more advanced assets as, as you talked about, Fred, also moving into you know 3D and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but but in your experience, Jason, is there any you know typical reason to act? You know, sometimes there needs to be you know, a spark igniting uh, decision processes. Uh, um, is there any, you know, often used, uh, you know, reasons to act um, in this space, do you think? Yes, and I think the 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 impetus is really what Joe and Brett uh, alluded to. It's these tactical things. It's these organizational, operational type things that become a nightmare over time. I mean, when you have multiple agencies contributing things, and your IT department is having to provision access to folders, like nobody has time for this. And frankly, if you think about it from an employee satisfaction and retention standpoint. Nobody on your team wants to do that kind of work. And w especially in this day and age, we really have to be thinking about employee satisfaction and optimizing your spend and their time. You know, I mean, if you have employees that are doing very um, basic work like this, they're going to get bored and you're wasting your money and your time on your internal talent. You know, really... To optimize your 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 spend, you you need to have people doing very strategic work, um, not tagging content and giving access to to folders. You know these are things that the machine should be doing. So I think the other thing that we should be looking at is uh, is is really how do we solve for these operational issues, but also how do we get the most out of the team that we have in place because you know. Um, uh, you know, times have changed and, and, and uh, you know, uh, we're not going to be working with large teams anymore, you know, internally. I mean, everybody is trying to get the most out of the teams that they have. And, and, the, and the same goes for the, the members of your team. They want to be doing an empowered job. Um, so I think by leveraging DAM um, and, and, and other automation technologies, 
uh, you're able to really uh, help uh, help your team stay focused on the things that that really move the needle and move your business forward. I think that's a very good point, and I I think that's often overlooked, and and uh, I haven't really thought that much of it. But obviously, if you especially I think with the new generation of people come into to workplace and talent, they want to have purpose, they want to have meaningful jobs, and obviously that's not doing you know tedious and repetitive tasks, and and and, and there is uh, tools to do that. But but um, coming over to you, Joe. Um, so when you made those you know discoveries and decided that you wanted to you know, solve this problem. Um, I'm pretty confident you had a lot of, you know, different options to choose from different vendors, uh, different types of technologies. And uh, what was, can you share a little bit, you know, what was your process of making those decisions and what were some of the decision criteria that you had in, in, in your team? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think just like many other companies, you know, we have a purchasing process. And some of that purchasing process obviously involves us going out and doing some research with various different team members and purchasing to find, you know, what are the solutions that are out there in the marketplace? Um, today, we, you know, we had a history of using a solution because one individual maybe had made a decision. It wasn't, we weren't really looking at it holistically. And I think, you know, Jason spoke to digital transformation a lot of the systems that are out there potentially don't support that type of activity. And that's definitely one thing, right, that the Volvo Group, we're really trying to do is really transform our company from, you know, what we would say is a more traditional business into more of a, a, a digital realm. So part of that was is that we did look at a lot of different products and we took in internally and we looked at you know what is really the biggest factors that we are struggling with and so you know I like this kind of concept in conversation around a Swiss Army knife so we had an older dam solution that would be equivalent of a Swiss Army knife it had a lot of features and functions it did a lot of wonderful things but then at the end of the day you know if you want to cut a rope if you're gonna you know take a big piece of rope and you need to cut it you're not really thinking about bringing the Swiss Army knife to do that task, right? You need something that is really specific and on point to actually get the job done. And that was really the biggest criteria that we came away with is that we had two features. One is we need to get the job done, which we would all agree. That's what we need to do, right? So um, implementing, you know, a solution that can connect out to multiple different websites that has a good uh, media portal that allows multiple different types of users with different access rights and things of that nature to come in and get assets, to share assets, all those wonderful things. Um, and, and then the other part of that was, is that we really wanted to have a, a really highly adopted solution. Many of the solutions that we looked at, I, honestly, I got so many emails and phone calls after the demos of saying, no way we're going to go down that path because the users just couldn't wrap their head around it. So most of our contributors, while, um, and I think Jason brought this up as well, Nobody wants to do a bunch of IT things. It, it's a factor in things that we do every day, but we don't want to have a horrible user experience being at work. Work is work. We appreciate work and we understand that that means it's not easy every day, but we don't need to make our lives harder because if we do, then trying to troubleshoot or understand where there's problems or understanding workflow issues, how does content get deployed properly? How do we trace it? All these wonderful things that we need to do to actually prove out KPIs, it becomes much harder. So the usability was just a huge factor, not only for the editors, but also for the consumers on the other side. Excellent input, and and I think what you're sharing is also you know the connectivity. You know, if you collect uh, the brand assets, the the marketing assets in one location, it needs to be connected, needs to be able to share with people, to share with, with other systems. Um, um, and I think you made a point there about the Swiss knife. I see a lot of customers, you know, having, you know, to make decisions between best of breed or sweets, um, uh, you know, do you buy something that can do a lot of things or, or something that can only do one thing. Uh, and the other thing, uh, a very good point is adoption. Uh, you know, you need people to, 
to adopt any any system uh, and and then there's no different that if if, if they don't like being there uh, you know they won't they won't they won't join the party and uh, and they won't you know the organization won't benefit from it so uh, 100 uh, percent true yeah so, um, interesting point there so maybe over to uh, to you brett so um uh, you've also been heading the dam implementation and uh, and what experiences and and the learnings have you gone through there in terms of uh uh of um you know let, let me roll back to the decision process i think you uh, you also had something to share in terms of uh your decision process um sure absolutely so i mean just very similar to, to joe's situation where you know we had to find something that was usable uh, that the the users were gonna you know enjoy using it and as a single source of the truth for, your assets and things like that. Kind of a main driver for us, though, is once we, I keep, keep, excuse me, I keep mentioning this, but we, as we took a step back, you know, we we looked at, okay, we really do have a, a big problem internally, and so we knew that when we made this decision on the solution, that it was going to end up being a tier one application within our industry or within our organization. So just like our uh, ERP system, which we use SAP. Um, our website is is very crucial. It's vital. It's a tier one application as well. It's built on a platform called Sitecore, and we knew that sitting between those two is going to have to be our whatever solution is going to have to integrate with those three, or those two rather. And we were going to make this kind of this triangle of these these three solutions in the middle of our, our organization because it was not only going to be the single source of truth for our assets for our products. All departments were going to be using it. Field sales, external customers. So. I mean, absolutely, it was going to be a tier one application. So kind of integration and availability was kind of a main driving factor that we looked at. We wanted something that was going to be easy to integrate with, um, scalable, where we can you know, scale that up, make sure that we could either deploy to cloud or scale it up if we posted it on prem. And then how it was how it integrated with uh, Sitecore was was one of the main driving factors which is like i said we put a lot of information in site core it's not just necessarily driving our website but it's we have synchronization from uh, sap it happens nightly that pulls down product information automatically that populates out to the website and that's where our distributors go I mean, we're a b2b company so we don't sell directly to consumers but we have people who need to start up their own e-commerce websites but get our metadata and our images for, for their own sites. And so we needed the ease of integration with third parties. And so that was really kind of our main factor, like how scalable is the solution, IT standpoint, what are the integration points? And then we also did look at the usability, um, you know, cause that's also a big factor as well. If people aren't gonna use it, then you know, there, there's no sense in implementing it. So, um, you know, that, that was kind of what we discovered that we did want to make that a tier one application and we kind of looked at the different solutions that would integrate with you know, what we had and uh, how easy was it to, to bolt on additional things if needed. Yeah, great. So I just want to ch check with the tier one. I mean, I, I assume it's not something you call out lightly. Uh, uh, that application gets called out as, as a tier one application. Uh, was that, you know, the system from the beginning or, or was that something that that it evolved into uh, during that it become became that critical for you? Well, once we realized that the, it was going to solve a big problem within the industry, I mean, or their organization, because we had no solution before. Our assets were literally everywhere. I mean, sitting on a Linux box in somebody's closet and on file servers and emails. And so once we knew that this was going to be a single source of truth for, hey, this is the product image, this is the latest and greatest um, information product sheet for this product, that it absolutely had to be a tier one application because if people rely on it, then you know they kind of again, what's the point? They need to know that they have faith in the product that it's going to work. It's going to be available when they need it on the device that they want it on, whether it's on your desk or in the field on an iPad. And you know, and in that regard, you know, absolutely, it had to be a tier one application. Yeah, excellent. All right, so um, so maybe you know. Just uh, bringing you, Jason, back into the conversation again from from a broader perspective there. So, um, so when you look at you know customers in buying decisions in in this, does this reflect you know what what customers you know go through or or is there anything to add in terms of you know the the criteria or 
or the process that you know companies either do or should do uh, go through in terms of uh, of such a a decision process yeah i you know so when we assist customers in making decisions like this you know um we first of all start with an exhaustive list of requirements and having some experience in this industry um, we have a lot to contribute to that conversation, but we literally create a matrix, you know, a spreadsheet of all of these requirements. And um, and then we go into the vendors and we actually do a technical deep dive <clears throat> with with the, the technology team. I mean, you know, no offense, but you guys are software salespeople. And, uh, and and so is Sitecore and, and EpiServer and Optimizely and all all of the big the big names and um, so someone got to call BS on some of these features and um, and and so what what we do is we go in and actually uh, go beyond the demo and and first of all based on our experience but also really digging into the specific features because it's it's one thing to have a, a checklist of oh does it do this but really what you want to know is how does it do this and does it do it in the way that's going to support that actual requirement there's there's a there's an interpretation there's a translation there that has to happen so um you know in terms of that shopping experience i really feel like like brands need to have an advocate some some very technical people that are going to go in and actually act on their behalf to do some digging it's like when you're buying a new house and you have an inspector go in to really actually dig inside the foundation and in, in the attics to make sure that there aren't any gotchas um so I, I would just suggest a very, very well organized buying process. Um, and because that that helps you kind of see through a lot of the the the, the glitz and the, and the shiny objects that that the salespeople are trying to throw at you. Because, you know, every, every software salesman wants to wants to tell you that that their solution is going to cook your breakfast um and and do everything in the world for you but but the truth is that that, that there it's the, the truth is somewhere in in the middle there and you just need to know exactly what it's going to do for you um and 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 where the value is um so um that that's always our uh, approach and, and our advice for for vendors who are making a decision like this yeah i think that's a very good advice you know do do, do your homework and, and do a thorough inspection and and especially, I think both both you, uh, Joe and Brad mentioned, you know, integrations and also, you know, user adoption. And and you can't read that out of the brochure. You need to, to to you know, view it and and let people see it and and work with it before that uh, on on uncovers really. Um, so let's let's switch a little bit to the implementation side of uh, of business. So um, maybe starting with you, Brad, this time. Um, so uh, when you you know, once you made your decision and and you, you know, had to run through the implementation and adoption uh, side of uh, in your organization, um, how did you how did you you know go through that and and end up being successful with the implementation? Sure. So I mean, people don't like change, right? So for us internally, you know, once we got through the implementation. Um, well, I guess let me take a step back again. So, you know, first we kind of brought customer service in, marketing, you know, looked at the demos of the different solutions, kind of got their buy-in. Uh, we got buy-in I mean, kind of on the project for implementation from C-level. And, you know, I, from a director standpoint, we had uh, very good uh, engagement, very good um, adoption or excitement, I guess is the word I'm trying to say, you know, that they saw potential in, in the solution that we chose. All right, so once we get through implementation, you know, everything's up and running. It now comes to the point where, all right, well, now we got to get the end users in the system and kind of deviate and get them to change their habits. And we knew that that was going to be a little bit of a challenge, right? So people hate changing that their habits that they've had for you know, 20 years. And we've had all these images and assets you know, scattered across the, the different avenues of storage that there is. And so, you know, kind of the approach that we ended up taking to ensure success and again, we had, you know, kind of director C-level buy-in on this approach. Uh, since we didn't have a solution before, there was no official process, but now we're going from nothing to a, a great solution, we kind of did what we call a force of hand, right? So we 
communicated out and said, all right, this is what is going to happen. You've all seen this demo. You've all seen this product. You all agree that this is you know, going to be fantastic. Now we're actually going to start using it and we're going to migrate all the assets into the solution and we're going to use it. And that it became a company policy. We wrote documentation on this is how you use the system. This is what you're expected to do with it. This is where you're expected to get the assets and how to integrate with it. And these are the people that you ask for support if you need help with it. You know, once all that was documented and rolled out, um, again, we kind of turned off the file shares and, and you know, did a little bit of force of hand as a little bit of tough love. There was a um, a little bit of you know flack and feedback at the very beginning, but you know, fast forward literally maybe a week or two, people were the light bulb was going off like, OK, this is really a, a solid solution. This is much better uh, than we were dealing with before. So it really didn't take long for them to see uh, the, the value of the solution that we chose. A lot of people have written, you know, lots of big books on, on change management, but I think that's a very good advice. You know, a little bit of force of hand, a switch off uh, uh, access to systems. I don't know if it's because you wear personal or wear personal protection gear uh, that you have the bravery to do that, but uh, but that definitely did work for you. And, uh, and uh, I think it's a general good advice, at least to consider. Yep. I mean, it, like I said, it may not work, you know, in a larger corporation. I mean, we are pretty what we call lean and mean. Uh, we are worldwide. We have manufacturing facilities in five different countries, and but we run, um, but just between our sales, distribution, and our HQ staff, we only have about 300 employees. So we we are very lean and mean. So, you know, someone you know like uh, like Joe's size of company, uh, it may not be able to necessarily uh, do a force of hand, but um, it is something to consider. And like I said, for us, it worked out and uh, haven't looked back since. Yeah, good, good to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Brad. So maybe over to you, Joe, uh, to share a little bit on what, what was your, you know, how, how did you, you know, organize the implementation process and, and anything you learned about? It? Sure. Yeah. And I would, you know, just reflect on what Brett stated. I mean, I think that we we actually did more force of hand for sure um because it's just a human problem right we're all human we get used to doing things in a certain way and and uh i think once you get that consensus at the executive team level and hey this is what we're going to do you just have to get in there and do it and uh you might have you know pockets here and there that uh that are resistant but at the end of the day you know i think it goes back to that usability piece if you have a, a solution that's highly usable and people don't have to, you know, get out in an encyclopedia to try to decipher what to do next, um, that's really critical. So I, I re reflect on, on what Brett said is a, a definitely a good thing. Um, so from our adoption standpoint, uh, we kind of did very similar activities, right? So we got all the stakeholders in the room and basically anybody that owned assets we went through a process of curating all of the different uh, metadata that we would want to have and really start thinking about the value of information that we're putting into this system. Because before in our older solution, um, we had, you know, content was just named all kinds of different things. Sometimes, you know, it was like you upload an asset directly from a camera. Well, that's not going to help anybody as we're trying to, you know, disperse information from a central hub. It needs to mean something um, to more than one person. So we're really focused on naming conventions, um, what type of fields are available, and in making sure that we lock down 99.9% .9 of all fields, right? We didn't want anything that was just open-ended so that, you know, when we started putting in data, the search engines work properly. When we started pushing these things down into Sitecore and we want to make sure that SEO um, values are there, I don't want to have to do those in two different places, right? That's why we have the dam. It's it's our hub for this type of information. So it's just like really thinking about that. And we, we wrote out policies that helped us and they were guardrails. They weren't there to stop us from doing anything. They were to keep us on the road to make sure that we were doing the right thing. So therefore those assets can be repurposed time and time and time again. And we didn't lose additional digital capabilities because we got sloppy in the beginning. Um, and then the only other one I would add is just to think about our culture. You know, our, every business has its own culture and the way people work and that kind of thing. Um, we took that into account in the policies and how we 
we actually worked with the system. So, you know, humans being, you know, who we are, you know, we all have our nuances and my wife would tell you many things that I probably wouldn't want you to know. But nonetheless, you know, it's just thinking about how does a practical way to execute on these things, because we're going to um, have less resources than what we did yesterday. And all these things need to help us um, work that better together versus making things more difficult in our day to day. Excellent points, Joe. So maybe a follow up question there is. Uh, so I think, you know, sometimes uh, this uh, issue with, you know, taxonomy and naming conventions uh, come up. Do you have any, you know, good advice from from how you work with it in terms of, uh, you know, nailing that uh, and, and where to do that in the process? Sure. Yeah, I think that came up pretty early in the process in the workshops. Um, one of the beauties, I think, and everybody probably on the call has experienced this, but when you get into a new solution, you have opportunity for change, right? And sometimes you need to listen to other people. So people like Jason that would come in and say, hey, guys, you need to have X, Y, and Z squared away. Make sure these are kind of your foundation, right? So anytime that we start thinking about those types of things, we really wanted to map out wh what brings us value. Because you can put in all kinds of different pieces of information, but they may not bring you value. And then as we started using the solution more and more, and we had enough content to actually see patterns, uh, we took the patterns that we believed that would actually bring more success and took the other ones and got them out of the system. So additional fields and things of that that sat in the system that you know, yes, they were good, important information, but they weren't practical information or information that could be ported into other places. So we just kind of took that approach to simplify what is our core pieces that we need to have to meet our different business objectives, things that need to be ported into other websites. And we kind of left it at that. And then the last thing here that we did, which I, th I think is pretty common now, but if you talk about just agile processes, we try to meet um, bi-weekly, um, depending on the month, you know, summertime, it's a little bit less, but we try to meet frequently enough just to have a touch base. Is there anything that we're missing? Is there any other types of, you know, beyond just change requests, right? Is there business operation opportunities that we need to be looking for and implementing into the solution? And it can be as simple as, hey, we have a new product, so we need to add that into, you know, our product listing. but it's really just having that iteration constantly with the team to keep everybody sharp and then reconstituting the use of the system in the way that we intended it to be used and helping to to bring on new people because that's the other part of it there's always new people coming in there's people leaving so it's like this is a consistent process that we're trying to establish and it seems like it's been working really well for the i think we now are a little bit a year and a half um, into using this uh, particular solution today Excellent. Good point, uh, Joe. It's about people and it's, it, it doesn't stop with the implementation. It, it's a continuous process. It's, a, it's as, uh, as you know, the solution and, and company evolves. Um, so thanks for that. And, and maybe over to you, Jason. Yeah. So, so from a consultancy uh, advisor perspective, uh, you know, anything to add in terms of, you know, how to be successful with the implementation of uh, such a type of technology? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, I think I think when a lot of brands look at um, this this whole exercise, um, they see picking the right solution as as the big win and and the measure of success. Um, but what I'm always encouraging our clients to uh, to look at is adoption is actually the real measure of success. If if, if everyone on your team is feeling empowered and their job is easier, then you as a decision maker in an organization are the hero. That's your win. And anything less than 100% adoption and satisfaction is a, lo is a lose, is a loss. Um, and I know that's a really high standard to hold ourselves to, but, but this is really critical. Um, and, and I, and so I, I think this is, you know, there's, there's kind of an art and a science to the organizational change in the training 
that that needs to happen to make sure that your organization is 100% on board and they're maximizing this investment. So excitement is part of it. You know, the demos are part of it. Getting everybody pumped up about that is, is what you need to reach them. And that is when you come in with really well, you know, uh, written documentation and training. But but the other part of it is unteaching. We do a lot of training uh, for for our clients, and and what we find is that when we're moving people from one platform to another, they have a tremendous number of questions, tactical questions about the particular functions. I did this function over here, this way. How do I do it over there? You know, and so there's this unteaching process that has to happen. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, implementing a system like DAM, this is a radical change for people. You know, I mean, a, a lot of functions go away now and a, a, a lot of new functions are there. And, and the processes that you're using to actually uh, put content in are different. The whole picture is different. So... Really, um, this is where organizational change services come in uh, to place. And, um, and and this is something that um, a lot of brands should be relying on their vendors to do because their vendors should presumably be familiar with, uh, with the platforms and the processes, you know, on both sides and, and be able to, to provide that perspective. And so I think that, you know, one thing I would encourage brands to do is to is to to look at uh, vendors that are are specialists in organizational change and training and and do a very thorough job and have a servant's heart about that i think there are a lot of vendors out there that think it's all about the implementation and then they step away and they say oh good luck that's up to you you know do whatever you want to do to get your team on board but that's not serving you you know that, and and really, your vendor's responsibility is is, is to help you with the adoption process, because ultimately, that's how you're going to be measured. Your success is going to be measured is whether everybody's on board, and you're seeing the 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 efficiencies. You know, those efficiencies is 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 how you're judged, and and so I you know I applaud you both for um, kind of muscling your way through it. Um, but, but there is, there is an easier way to do this, you know, and, and I think that really comes down to some very thoughtful planning, very thoughtful training, um, and, and unteaching people how to do things, uh, and, and then reteaching them how to do this in a much more efficient way. So there is, you know, I, I would say create a budget for your organizational training, uh, your organizational change and training, make sure that there's a line item and make sure that this is something that your vendor is taking extremely seriously and not just some afterthought, some, yeah, yeah, we'll put together five pages of training for you. Make sure that in the budget, you have got a well thought out plan about how you're going to, uh, how you're going to, to uh, succeed at the adoption process. Yeah, I think I think great, great point. Thanks for making that. It's and I, I think it resonates with with all that uh, Brett and, and Joe has said as well. It's not about you know technology as alone. It's about getting the people on board. It's obviously getting the tech, taxonomy naming conventions. It's about culture. It's about people. It's about change. Uh, so it is in, in all that mix of of organizational change we find we find implementations of them as well. Um, so let me you know take a last round um, and I think I'll. I'll boil two questions into to the last round here and starting with you Brett uh, the one question is if you could share a little bit about you know what's next uh, what 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 does the future hold of them and 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 then lastly um, if you you know at the end of this conversation have you know a good advice for people listening into this uh, we'd be happy to take this away as well sure and so just getting this solution implemented we've been on it for about a year and a half maybe two years now as well and this is just the beginning for what we're gonna do in our digital transformation phase. So because I've mentioned earlier that part of our solution was looking at something that was can be integrated with um, a scalable solution from a technology standpoint, and because we're B2B and we help our, our distributors build their own e-commerce sites, 
what we're doing next is actually we're taking a combination of uh, SAP product data as far as pricing and availability. We're taking our site core data, which is our marketing uh, descriptions, things like that. We're um, also taking the DigiSuite assets themselves. And we're wrapping those together in a thoughtfully designed uh, REST API system that we're hoping to deploy in Q4 this year. So it's going to be a lot easier for our distributors to get their information in real time, uh, you know, on demand when they want it, because today it's a lot of manual process. And because now um, our solution is in the mix of a tier one right in the middle of that triangle, right in the middle of our organization, it's so easy for us to do that now. And it was kind of a, a no brainer idea that, you know, everything's going digital. Uh, we, we're still a very traditional company as well and look into the next phase of, like I said, getting our digital assets out there quickly, because uh, today it's a huge manual process, because they're already getting that data from us. Today it's Excel spreadsheets and zip files. So if we're allowing our sales folks to get it digitally now, why can't we allow our customers to get it digitally? So that was our, our biggest next step. We're really looking forward to, to kind of rolling that out. And, and like I said, our solution has been a, a huge part of that. And, and we wouldn't be able to do that you know, without the right solution in place. Um, so as far as, you know, kind of advice, I guess, you know, kind of looking forward is kind of one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning of, of the presentation is take a step back and look at your company holistically, right? So we actually didn't start looking for a damn solution. We started with a document repository, but found that having a solution like this can solve so many more problems that we had or didn't even know we had. So, you know, my thought is you know, maybe not silo in on a specific solution that you're trying to solve, but holistically look, take a look back and see what maybe else that it potentially can solve for you and other avenues that you can actually leverage the platforms in different ways that you may not have thought you know, to begin with. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, 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 you know, exciting to hear your journey from starting with, you know, looking at document management to, to looking at, you know, broader perspective and dam, and now extending your thoughts way beyond your own organization, uh, thinking about serving, you know, uh, uh, distributors, uh, resellers with, uh, with the content so that your content supply chain becomes as efficient as, as your, you know, other supply chain in the company. So very exciting. Thank you for that. Yep. And, and to you, Joe, maybe uh, the same two questions, yeah. a little bit of thoughts on, on future for DAM and Volvo uh, trucks sure. and, uh, and maybe a last last advice. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think the first thing is, is that, Brett, we probably just need to talk at some point. I think we probably have a lot of common shared experiences here. Uh, so it's, it's good to, to have a fellow colleague out there somewhere. But um, I, I think... Um, Right now, if we look towards the future of what we've been working on is that uh, COVID has accelerated our B2B processes to become more B2C. And I think everybody can kind of recognize those types of things. And so one of the pieces that we're working on is to distribute down to our dealers. Uh, we've already implemented single sign-on for certain user groups so that they can get specific personalized information um, that they need for either their sales process, marketing processes, or aftermarket uh, processes that they have. So we're expanding upon that um, every day. We're also onboarding um, a couple new solutions, e-commerce solutions, and so those are going to be plugged into the dam. So we're excited about you know, extending that environment just to one more place. And then we have a lot of applications in Volvo Group. If I told you guys how many applications there are, it would probably scare you. It scares me. Um, but we do have a lot of opportunity to utilize the APIs to distribute content. And that's a really, it's a really high value operation for us. Because like I said before, we have information all over the place. We don't always have the most accurate information all over the place. So we really are working towards that uh, activity. So as far as what would I say to myself a year and a half ago, um, I would say, you know, focus in on naming convention, naming convention, naming convention. And the, the biggest reason is, is that we have, for example, 65% uh, of the content that's inside of the dam today, it's connected to a SKU. So it's pretty straightforward when we talk about those types of items, but it's the other assets where we struggle. And so it could be, you know, a sales sheet that talks about, you know, different product offerings, or it could be an image of a vehicle. 
all of those things really you need to hone in on that content just making sure that all the use cases that you have think about the naming convention and what would it mean not to you or to another editor what does it mean to the guy that's consuming it just extremely just simplify the method of madness really think and hone in on that the other one is is just to reiterate people that not, aren't necessarily connected to websites they they really need to understand seo value because each asset when it gets deployed to other places it needs tangible content that actually helps facilitate conversation whether it's conversation from somebody searching in google or somebody searching on site all of these things are valuable pieces of information that you just need to make sure that it's it's discussed and help educate them. Use a partner to help educate. Why is SEO even important when we're talking about a dam? It's important because it's part of that digitalization that needs to take place, and you can't do it without this uh, metadata being uh, effective. Excellent point, Joe. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I think we're running a little bit over time, so I'll give you a challenge, uh, Jason. You'll you'll have the last word on on this panel discussion. Uh, so maybe if you can, you can wrap it up and share your thoughts on what, what is the what is the future of of dam holds for for organizations and maybe if you have uh, one piece of advice as well uh, to wrap it up. Yeah, so I, I think the future is is about testing and optimization, personalization, and search. This is where organizations have the greatest ability to create a competitive advantage in their industry. And we've been building, we've all been building foundations for a very long time. Um, the technology is, is there now. And so we're really at a precipice now in our industry to be able to actually deploy these things in a meaningful way. Um, so I'm very excited about this point in, in history. I, I've, I've been, building foundations, so to speak, and chasing this personalization dream since 2002 when we started Engagency. Um, and, uh, you know, personalization is, is not a new concept, um, but but now the technology has really matured to the point. You, you look at you look at solutions like Optimizely and their new optimization as a service. Um, and these are this is some very sophisticated uh, uh, capabilities here, and but to to be able to take advantage of these new types of optimization and personalization technologies, you have to have your data structured. You've got to have your assets in order, um, and and you've got to have the right APIs um, to be able to to push and pull things and step out of the way and let machines do the work. So really, the future is about is is about these type of things. Um, it's it's about reducing the the manual labor on on your your team and and letting the machines do the work, letting letting AI do the thinking, a lot of the analysis. Um, I won't even speculate on on some of the more futuristic things that that I see coming, but but it's it and and then it's really about search too. I think this is an often um, overlooked aspect of of our industry. Um, search can completely eliminate the need for a navigation structure if you do it well. And we all know, you know, when you're dealing with a very large company like Volvo, you know, your information architecture starts to break down after a while. Your buyer, you know, um, might, might have a hard time with what your UX person came up with. So giving them a really, really uh, nice search experience is going to, uh, short circuit that and and allow them to get exactly where they want when they want to. So um, it's it's really about finishing the the, the foundation and, and thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank thanks to all of you. I mean it's uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, I've learned so much and I really hope sincerely that uh, you know people listening in on this um, maybe when it's live recorded or at some point later uh, there is learnings in here and I hope uh, if we can help you know, one person, one organization out there uh, being a little bit more successful with uh, adopting a technology like this and making improvements in their organization. I think we've fulfilled uh, the purpose of uh, of this 45 minutes. So 
Uh, thank you for joining me. It has been such a great pleasure and honor uh, to have you here on the panel discussion. And thanks for spending your time. And uh, uh, yeah, wish you all a, a nice summer. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, thanks for having us. And uh, thank you, Kim. And fine, y'all take care. Nice to meet you, gentlemen. Right. Yeah. All right. Take care. Take care, guys. Take, take care. care.